My name is David Moore. I'm the General Manager Europe for Gameville. Uh, I'll be talking about the global expansion of Gameville. We've recently opened offices in Southeast Asia and in Europe. So I'll mostly be talking about Europe. I'll give a short introduction on Gameville as a company because I feel like it might not be as well known uh, because we are Korean most of the time. I'll show some examples of our games. I'll show some revenue, some like, decision process behind moving to Europe. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how I am going about opening the office right now, the people that I'm hiring, what I'm doing. Um, I will share some learnings of the few months that I have been working on this. I mean, I've been with Gameville since October last year, so it's not very long. Um, and that'll basically be it. I hope we will also have some time for questions. So, Gameville is a Korean mobile gaming publisher. We've been around for quite a while. The company is more than 15 years old. It was founded in 2000 as Fistnet and then rebranded as Gameville. So we're actually celebrating our 15th anniversary as Gameville right about now. Um, we've recently done about 100 million US dollars, give or take, revenue last year for the first three quarters. We have not really announced the fourth quarter result yet, so that uh, will come. Uh, so, but I, I guess we'll probably be something like 130-ish million US dollars in revenue, just to give you an idea of the size of the company. Most of that, of that revenue, to be very honest, is in Korea, and I'll be showing slides to that effect later on. Um, some uh, interesting facts are we recently acquired a company called Come To Us. This was in late 2013. Come To Us should be maybe even more well-known than us because they have a really big hit at the moment, which is called Summoner's War. It's like a top 10, top 20 mobile game in pretty much all the big relevant countries. They're currently starting to do very big TV promotion in the US, have done a really, really nice spot. Uh, for the game. And so that's Gameville. Um, some of our games you may or may not have heard of are Critica, Darkness Reborn, Elune Saga. These are kind of the latest ones. We do have the Major League Baseball license in the US. Our biggest game in Korea at the moment is called Dragon Blaze. Uh, we have a long-standing MMO series on mobile, on mobile devices that's called Xenonia Online, which we are currently uh, preparing the latest release to be translated into European and uh, US languages. And uh, yeah, that's kind of our portfolio. Spirit Stones and Monster Warlord used to be the biggest games for a long time. By now, I would say Critica is probably the most successful game in the West. It was also recently featured by Apple. Thank you very much. Um, and I've also brought some footage for you for Dragon Blaze, just to give you an idea of the kind of game that we have. So this would be a good moment to turn on the sound. 2014, mobile RPG's Rune 팩트클 판타지 모험이 당신을 부른다. 우리의 모험이 전설이 되는 것. 별이 되어라. So uh, I apologize that was in Korean. Um, that's because the game is not out in the West yet. We will release Dragon Blaze in Europe and the US later this year. Um, and I just wanted to show you some gameplay and also since this is a you know, conference about games and games should be fun, I'm also showing you a Korean spot that we put on TV for uh, Dragon Blaze, which is kind of nice. This is probably not what we will do in Europe, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. So, that was a Korean K-pop band called uh, Orange Caramel. They're actually singing about the power-up inside the game. And uh, this kind of ad is very important in Korea. If you really want to make it to the top, you will see a lot of that kind of stuff on the Korean subway. So um, to talk a little bit about numbers, these are the, um, the revenues for Gameville in South Korea for the last two years. You can see a nice rise in revenue. We did um, about 26, yeah, 26 million US dollars in the third quarter alone in South Korea. Um, according to an AppBanny report in November of last year, we were flagged as the number one in terms of downloads, number two in terms of revenue in Korea. So Game is doing very well in its home market, um, which is cause to celebrate. But also, of course, it's kind of a, an issue in the sense that it will be very hard to go even higher from that because if you are like, fighting at the top, the competition gets bigger. So you have to look um, for other places where you can grow your revenue. So this next slide shows the US revenue. Again, same time frame, last two years. Also, revenues are going up, mostly driven uh, in 2014, I would say, by Major League Baseball and by uh, Critica. Again, we're only going up to the third quarter. We've done about 4 million 
in the US in the third quarter. So you can see the magnitude US versus Korea. It's like a really big difference. Um, and here now I'm showing the European revenues. Um, there was supposed to be a European star flag there, but the graphic was designed by the US team. So I'm sorry about that. Um, European revenues, uh, third quarter 2014, not that much smaller than US revenues, also going up, um, driven again by Kritika mostly. And then in December last year, we came out with Darkness Reborn and Elune Saga, two very successful titles for us. And what's funny about the European revenue is that we didn't really do anything in Europe. So there is a US office. It's been around for a while. It's based in Los Angeles uh, on the West Coast. In Europe, there is nothing, or there was nothing uh, at the time when these revenues were coming in. The, James, the games were translated very basically into German, French, Russian, but like no support, no operations, nothing. And it's still going up. So to recap on this, we have a very strong performance in the home market. Like Gameville is fighting at the top, maybe a top one spot, top two spot all the time. So very difficult to grow even further. Um, we have great developments in the US where we see the the uh, effect of having a local office is really paying off. The marketing in the US is going well. We have partnerships with the Major League Baseball uh, Association, which would be difficult to set up if you do not have an office on the ground. Um, and then we also see revenues in Europe going up, even though there is no effort at all. So that kind of leads to the logical thinking that, well, why not open an office in Europe uh, to push the revenues even more? And that's kind of what we're doing. These are the um, global locations for Gameville at the moment. So we do have an office in Seoul, obviously, in Gangnam, six-story building, quite nice. Uh, we have an office in Tokyo and in Beijing. Uh, we have an office in Los Angeles, obviously. Uh, Taipei just opened, and we have a Southeast Asian office in Singapore. It's actually also one in Malaysia and in Vietnam and in Thailand. And then Berlin, uh, on the left, that's me. <laughs> and I'm currently setting that up uh, for Gameville. We, our markets in Europe, where we are the strongest, I would say, is Germany, France, Russia. That's where we are doing our most revenue at the moment. Um, we, all, we are also doing OK in Spain, but Spanish and Portuguese as a language is probably more important for us because of the Latin American market. I think that's probably the same for most other people here in the room. Um, we are testing out Italy and Turkey at the moment. Um, we are coming out with Darkness Reborn in Turkish language next week. And we share some responsibility with the US team still for uh, the English language territories in Europe, which for us are, of course, UK, uh, Nordics, and then all the smaller countries kind of between uh, Germany and Russia, basically. So what were the requirements for the European office? Of course, it is important to have good community management and customer support. As I said before, we didn't really have anything of that. So if you're a French player of Kritika and you have a problem, there is no way for you to, to write a ticket in French, and that is difficult, right? Because people in France don't like speaking English. It's kind of the same in Germany. If you don't speak English and you're a German player of a, a Gameville title, you have a problem. So now we are setting up the support in French, German, Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, and that helps a lot. We really see um, the quality of our um, Google Play reviews going up. A lot of people are complaining about stuff. They will give you a bad rating on Google Play, which is a, a big issue if you're a mobile game developer. So you really want to um, address these reviews right inside the store. You want to answer to these people very quickly. You want to tell them, hey, sorry, we're taking your problem seriously. Here, we fixed it for you. And then if you can convert a few of these people to just change the star rating to a four or five stars, um, that really has an impact on your overall rating. And as you might know, if you don't have like a four-star rating on the Play Store, then it's just a problem. So the community management was a very, very big, um, it's a very big uh, topic for us. And I'm very happy to say that I now have kind of most of my communities, community managers set up and running. Um, localization is also something that we are taking seriously. Um, as I said before, games were just translated somehow using freelancers in the US um, with no real quality control, quality check. As you can imagine, it's kind of hard to check the quality of a Russian localization if you don't have a Russian person in your team. You have no idea what's, what's going on. You just have to take it um, and believe that it's good. So now I'm building up a team for localization. We have two translators per language. Uh, we're doing well for Russian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, German. And we, we are fixing a lot of issues and problems in the current games. And I very much hope that we will really show a quality improvement for the new titles that are coming out. 
And this is not just for translating the game, this is also for translating marketing materials, banners, your app store presence, all of that. And having that look professional and good and clean is obviously going to help your conversion rate for all the marketing you do. It's going to help you in your relationship with Apple and Google because they really value a good presence on their stores. And it's ultimately also going to help your revenue, revenue. at least that's what we hope. And um, the reason we can have people in-house, because I think a lot, a lot of game developers will say, well, translators, no need to have them in-house. You can just have them freelance, is we have so many titles. We released three games in the last quarter alone. Um, we have a lot of other games that we are continuously operating. Most of our games are kind of more hardcore, mid-core to hardcore titles, uh, fantasy RPGs, strategy games, action games. Most of those have a lot of text. So there is, simply put, enough work to have a translator full-time. And then when you have full-time people, the quality incentive is very different. They will put in the hours. They will really care about their product. They will actually want this to look good and sound good, whereas if you have them freelance, you, you continuously have different people working in your game. You don't really know who is working on the game. You might have like an agency that always assigns somebody else to you, and it will be very hard for you to manage the quality. So this is why we chose to do it in-house, and we are very happy with the results so far. Then the third responsibility is business development. For us, business development means obviously Apple and Google. Um, as you may know, typically you're, the person you talk to with Apple is, the person, is a person where you are publishing your games. So if you're a Korean publisher, then you will have somebody in Korea that is kind of the most important contact for you at Apple and Google. However, it still makes sense to also maintain a relationship with your local partners, Apple and Google. Uh, some companies hire people for that and put them, uh, let them live in London and just uh, work all day uh, on Apple and Google. I see one here. <laughs> uh, it's a very important job. Um, I'm kind of trying to do that from Berlin, which works OK, because there is a Google office in Berlin. And it's not far to go to Apple in London and in Munich. Um, also, the other part of business development for us, since we are a global publisher, is obviously the relationship to game developers. Um, we do publish games from Europe. We currently have a Spanish developer working on a very nice game for us that I can't really talk about. Uh, we have published games from Ukraine and Finland in the past. Um, we also have some South American developers working for us. So I'm also like the first contact person for any developer that might want to be published by Gameworld. We're also doing PR and marketing from Europe. Well, we will also be doing live operations at a later stage. So all in all, it's like a big package that you want to handle locally. And it makes sense for us to do this from Berlin, because Berlin is very cheap. Uh, it's also located very centrally. And it is very easy to find people in Berlin. So I was fortunate to hire my initial team of five translators within the space of one week, which is really fast. I was also lucky. But uh, it's possible, and it's possible because a lot of people like to live in Berlin, and it's very cosmopolitan, especially if you're hiring for the sort of more soft skill jobs like translation, community management, maybe biz dev, marketing. You can find a lot of people in these kind of fields in Berlin very easily. Um, programming, engineering might be a little bit more tricky, but again, I think Berlin as a hub is growing and growing and becoming more and more attractive for not just gaming, but also like web, internet, mobile industry in general. So it's just a good place to, to set up your office. So where, we, where are we at at the moment? I have a team for translators. I have a team for community management. We're 10 people right now. I'm still hiring for a few positions. If you're a French translator, please talk to me. Um, the most exciting stuff right now is really getting going with the PR and marketing. Um, I have an agency working with me that helps me a lot with the PR stuff. Marketing, there's a lot of companies in Berlin to talk to. There's a lot of companies here at the conference. Um, so I'm starting to reach out to local partners to get that going. And then the third step, which will be live operations, is something we have yet to tackle. Uh, we, we are looking a lot at what people like Kabam are doing. We're spending a lot of time and effort and money on that. The Kabam operation is much, much bigger than ours in Berlin right now with about 150 people. This is something we will probably tackle the second half of this year. And I hope that maybe next year I can talk about that, which I guess will also be more exciting. And I'm almost done. Um, it's been four months that I've been doing this. I have some lessons learned. Um, some of this stuff might be very basic, but I feel like it's still worth mentioning. Um, my key learning, I think, is just finding the right people for the right job and waiting and taking your time to really hire uh, the right person. As I said, I was very lucky to hire my first batch of translators. Hiring the second batch of translators is proving very, very difficult uh, because the first translators have a high quality standards and they just shoot down everybody. Um, which is both annoying but also helpful because at the end of the day I want somebody who is really good. 
Also, what I find is maybe even more important than the skill is actually the mindset of the person and the, that they work together with the rest of the team. So I am very amazed by people staying long in the office. We have a temporary, pretty crappy, nasty, not really nice office right now in Berlin. Uh, but people really put in the hours. They really like the games. They work on the weekend. The community managers stay on forever. They're not paid that well, but they're really um, putting in a lot of time. So I'm very lucky that I found these people, and I will be very careful with hiring the next batch of people. Um, also, in terms of making the hires, as I said before, the competition in Berlin is slowly heating up for talent. So there are companies like Kabam, which will give you really awesome California-style perks with like catered lunches and bus tickets and uh, gym tickets and all this kind of stuff. And that's pretty awesome. And I'm sure a lot of people like this. But our approach is more a personal freedom style approach. We let people come into the office kind of on their own accord. We let them work from home. Um, which is very doable if you have a translator job because you can really measure um, the, just the output of work because you know exactly the tasks and if they are done or not. And it's also very easy to um, at least judge from a non-technical side if the task is done because you see words and they are there. So um, I'm giving people this kind of freedom and it turns, to work, turns out very well for me because um, everybody so far is saying they really like the job. Of course, it's only four months, so maybe I will speak differently next year. Um, another very interesting learning is just the, the communication between our US team and our Korean team, which is, of course, central for us. So um, we report mostly to the US people. Our community managers are trained by the US community managers. Our translators are coordinated by somebody in the United States. This person has then to coordinate with uh, South Korea, where most of our development happens. But she also has to coordinate with Southeast Asia and Japan and all the other offices. So you can imagine there's a lot of um, discussion going back and forth. There's a lot of cultural difference and language difference. And um, a very, very basic learning is that if people are not in your office, you will think that they are stupid. That's just a fact. So uh, I've had so many times when we come in into the office in the morning and there are emails from the, from the US translation team or from the Korean developer or something, and some lines have been changed in the, in the translation text and something has to be redone or whatever, and our translators will just go, oh, what are these idiots doing? This makes no sense. They are so stupid. Why are they making these changes? Um, and I can imagine it must be the other way around, in, like in the US office, when they will say, oh, god, why have the Europeans done this? Why is it not done or whatever? So what I would really, really encourage everybody to do who is in a similar situation is fly in your people and have them talk face to face as soon as possible. It's really, really very helpful. Um, we brought in the US uh, translation coordinator and the community management boss um, about four weeks after we, we started working. And instantly, the atmosphere changed. Like when those guys went back home, our translators would completely react absolutely differently to any requests that came come in. So that was really probably the most helpful learning for me to do this very quickly. And it paid off. It's still hard to build trust with your international partners, especially in a situation where you have developers that are then outsourcing work to translators, that are then giving work to translators in a different country. Um, we also see that translation is still not really treated with a lot of respect, especially in uh, Korea. Um, developers will constantly like, push uh, deadlines, change their text, not deliver it to you in a format that you can work with. So building this credibility and explaining that this is actually helpful and then showing that you are actually uh, succeeding is very important. This is something we will just have, we will, we will need time to do, um, but it's also very, very tricky. It's not just a given that they will accept you as an international office and just trust you all the time. A funny, um, kind, of, kind of funny learning is that written Korean doesn't really take up much space. Um, that's why all the Asian games are really having difficulty being translated well, because there's a lot of meaning in a small square symbol in Korean, and if you want to write this in German, you need a lot more space. Um, that was kind of a funny one. And then a personal learning for me was that it's very easy to become a bottleneck if you're the manager of an organization, and it is very, very good if you uh, give responsibility to the people that are actually doing the work and let them talk directly. So at the beginning, I would get translation requests. I would then distribute them to the translators, and that just doesn't work because I don't have time. So they just 
stay in the queue forever, uh, the requests, and they don't get done because I'm not forwarding them. That's just stupid. This ma makes no sense. So just letting go and just watching what your people are doing is very, very important. And the, very, the last learning uh, that we made is that over-communication can be a good thing because what we do in the European offices, our community managers, they check the games also for just if they are working or not. So we do hourly checks. They just play the game. Is the service up and running? And then we once had an issue where the service was not up and running, and it was the middle of the day in Germany, which means in the US, everybody is sleeping, and in Korea, also kind of everybody is sleeping. So what do you do? The game is not running. Uh, you have a problem. You need to communicate to somebody. You can't really reach out. Do I really want to wake up the US guy, or do I want to reproduce the problem again to really make sure that it exists? And our community manager was very careful to disturb the sleep of the Korean producer. Um, and so we kind of let this problem drag on until somebody in the US office woke up, which was too long because we lost half a day, maybe longer. And um, that's just a half a day or longer of revenue that is not there. So obviously, that's a problem. So you need to also instill this, like empower your people to actually call somebody and wake somebody up and, and tell them that, it's, yes, that is OK. And that's almost everything already. Um, I try to keep it brief. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. You can also email me to david at gamewithusa.com. Thank you so much, David. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Anyone? Right. I'm curious because we always listen at the conferences, well, at least here in Europe. Um, what you need to do to take your game from the west over to the east. So what are some of the challenges? I mean, you mentioned like the, the interface. Uh, you know, what are some other most common challenges that you face when you're trying to, to transfer the game over from east over to west? Well, just the translation process can be a little bit messy with the information going back and forth and when you finally have the finished script. Uh, but at the end of the day, translation is also fairly standard. So. Once you have worked out the kinks, it's not that hard to get translation going and, and just ensure quality by having good people on it. And then the question of how a game from the East becomes a success in the West is super big and can't really be answered. And we are puzzled by it as well. So we see Summoner's War, which is a very Asian game, Asian graphics, everything, very Korean, Japanese RPG style, doing really well in the West everywhere. And we don't know why. It's just a good game. Is there anything in particular that drives your colleagues in Korea crazy about the way the Germans do the business? <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> no. All right, good. And last chance for a question before we move on. All right, well, thank you so much, David. Thank you.